The Battle of Transloy was the last big attack by the 4th Army of the British Expeditionary Force in the 1916 Battle of the Somme in France, during the First World War. The battle was fought in conjunction with attacks by the French 10th and 6th Armies on the southern flank and the Reserve-5th Army on the northern flank, against Army Group Ruprecht of Bavaria created on 28 August. General Ferdinand Foch, commander of Group des Armées du Nord and coordinator of the armies on the Somme, was unable to continue the sequential attacks of September because persistent rain, mist and fog-grounded aircraft, turned the battlefield into a swamp and greatly increased the difficulty of transporting supplies to the front over the roads land devastated since 1 July. The German armies on the Somme managed a recovery after the string of defeats in September, with fresh divisions to replace exhausted troops and more aircraft, artillery and ammunition diverted from Verdun and stripped from other parts of the Western Front. Command of the German air service was centralized and the new Luftstreitkraft was able to challenge Anglo-French air superiority with the reinforcements and new, superior, fighter aircraft. The German flyers further reduced the ability of the Anglo-French airmen to support the armies with artillery observation and contact patrols in the rare periods of clear weather. The German armies lost much less ground and had fewer casualties in October than in September but the proportion of casualties increased from 78.9 to 82.3 percent of the Anglo-French total. Rain, fog and mud were lesser problems for the Germans, who had to carry supplies forward over a much narrower beaten zone and were being forced back onto undamaged ground. German bombardments on the few roads between the original front line and the line in October increased the difficulties of the British and French armies, the size and ambition of Anglo-French attacks was reduced progressively to local operations. Every soldier endured miserable conditions but the Germans knew that the onset of winter would end the battle, despite the many extra casualties caused by illness. The British and French outnumbered the Germans and could relieve divisions after shorter periods in the line. Severe criticism of General Sir Douglas Haig and General Henry Rawlinson during and since the war for persisting with attacks on October, was challenged in 2009 by William Philpot, who put the British share of the battle into the context of strategic subordination to French wishes, the concept of a general allied offensive established by Joffrey and the continuation of French attacks south of Le Transloy which had to be supported by British operations. In a 2017 publication, Jack Sheldon translated overlooked German material on the ordeal endured by the German armies. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Strategic Developments In September, Foch had managed to organize sequential attacks by the four Anglo-French armies on the Somme, which had captured more ground than any previous month and inflicted the worst monthly casualties on the Germans of the battle. During the Battle of Morval, the French 6th Army had crossed the peron bapaume road around Bouchavaines, the 4th Army had taken Morville, Les Bouffes and Goucourt in the centre and the Reserve Army, which became the 5th Army on 30 October, had captured most of Thiepel Ridge on the left flank. On 29 September, General Sir Douglas Haig instructed the 4th Army to plan operations to advance towards Bapaume, reaching Le Transloy on the right and Lupart Wood north of the Albert Bapaume Road on the left. The Reserve Army was to extend the attacks of the 4th Army by making converging attacks on the Anchor Valley after the Battle of Thiepel Ridge, by attacking northwards towards Lupart Wood, Earls and Mermont on the south bank. On 28 August, the Chief of the General Staff General Erich von Falkenhayn simplified the German command structure on the Western Front by establishing two army groups. Army Grupp Golvitz Somme was dissolved, and General Max von Golwitz reverted to the command of the 2nd Army. Gruppe Kronprinz Ruprecht controlled the 6th, 1st and 2nd Armies, from the Belgian coast, to the boundary of Gruppe Deutsche Kronprinz, south of the Somme battlefield. The emergency in Russia caused by the Brusilov Offensive, the entry of Romania into the war and French counterattacks at Verdun put further strain on the German army. Falkenhayn had been sacked from Oberster Heresleitum on 28 August and replaced by Hindenburg and Ludendorff. This third OHL ordered an end to attacks at Verdun and the dispatch of troops to Romania and the Somme Front. 
Colonel Fritz von Lorsberg, Chief of Staff of the Second Army, was also able to establish Ablossung's division and 6.2 to 9.3 miles behind the battlefield, ready to replace tired divisions. German counterattacks became bigger and more frequent, making the Anglo French advance slower and more costly. After the Anglo French attacks in mid September, a comprehensive relief of the frontline divisions had been possible. On 5 September, proposals for a shorter line to be built in France were ordered from the commanders of the Western armies, who met Hindenburg and Ludendorff at Cambrai on 8 September. The new leadership announced that no reserves were available for offensive operations, except those planned for Romania. Ludendorff condemned the policy of holding ground regardless of its tactical value and advocated holding frontline positions with the minimum of troops and to recapture lost positions by counterattacks. On 21 September, after the Battle of Flair's Cousillet, Hindenburg ordered that the Somme front was to have priority in the West for troops. During September, the Germans had sent another 13 fresh divisions to the British sector and scraped up troops wherever they could be found. The German artillery had fired 213 train loads of field artillery shells and 217 train loads of heavy artillery ammunition, yet the debut of the tank, the defeat at Thiepel and the 130,000 casualties suffered by the armies on the Somme in September, had been severe blows to German morale. Chapter 1 Section 2 – Tactical Developments German artillery on the Somme slowly improved in its effect, when Golvitz centralized counter-battery fire and used aircraft reinforcements for artillery observation, which increased the accuracy and efficiency of bombardments. The Second Army had been starved of reinforcements in mid-August, to replace exhausted divisions in the First Army and plans for a counter-stroke had been abandoned for lack of troops. Reinforcements for the Somme front in September began to reduce the German inferiority in guns and aircraft. Field artillery reduced its barrage frontage from 400 to 200 yards per battery, and increased its accuracy by using one air artillery flight per division. As the Germans had been pushed out of their original defenses, Lorsberg established new positions based on principles of depth, dispersal and camouflage, rather than continuous lines of trenches. Rigid defense of the front line continued but with as few soldiers as possible, relying on the firepower of machine guns firing from behind the front line and from the flanks. The area behind the front line was defended by support and reserve units, dispersed on reverse slopes, undulations and in any other cover that could be found, so that they could open machine gun fire by surprise, from unseen positions and then counter-attack swiftly, before French and British infantry could consolidate captured ground. The largest German counter-attacks of the Somme battle took place from 20 to 23 September, from the Somme north to Saint-Pierre vast wood and were destroyed by French artillery fire. Rather than pack troops into the front line, local, corps and army reserves were held back, in lines about 2,000 yards apart, able to make progressively stronger counter-attacks. Trenches were still dug, but were no longer intended to be fought from, being used for shelter during quiet periods, for the movement of reinforcements and supplies and as rallying points and decoys. Before an attack, the garrison tried to move forwards into shell holes, to avoid allied artillery fire and to surprise attacking infantry with machine gun fire. Opposite the French, the Germans dug new defences on a reverse slope from the Tortille stream at Allens to the west end of St. Pierre Vastwood and from there to Morville. The fourth position, R. I. Stellung, was dug from Cyselissel to Morville and Bepaume, along the Peron Bepaume Road. French agents also reported new construction 22 miles to the east. Ludendorff created 15 new divisions by combing out troops at depots and by removing regiments from existing divisions, the new 212th, 213th and 214th divisions replaced worn-out divisions opposite the French 10th and 6th armies. Chapter 2, Prelude Chapter 2 Section 1, Anglo-French Plan of Attack Fayol planned attacks to capture Cisicel, a twin village to the northwest of Saint-Pierre-Vastwood, followed by outflanking attacks to the north and south, avoiding a frontal attack. 
FIO expected to be ready to attack Suyisai cell by 7 to 8 October but if an attack towards Rokwani could begin earlier, the 4th Army was to attack to cover the French left flank. Suyisai cell was along the Peron-Bapom road and Sai cell lay at right angles on the east side, along the Moislane St. Pierre Vast road and overlooked a shallow valley to the north towards La Transloy. The difficulties of movement in the rear, Wet weather in October and the terrain channeled the attacks of the 6th Army into a gap between St. Pierre Vastwood and the 4th Army boundary. At the end of September, the 6th Army took over the 4th Army front at Morville, which widened the attack front to about 2.5 miles. The French 32 Corps, which held the front from Rancourt to Frigicourt, was to attack the Saizels and I Corps to the left would attack eastwards from Morville, to capture Bukovina, and Yata Jezov trenches in the German 4th position in front of the Peron Bapom Road, then capture the north end of the Saizels and reach Rockwiny. The British 4th, Reserve and 3rd Armies were to be ready by 12 October, the 4th Army to attack towards La Transloy, Bulancourt, the ridge beyond the Thiloy Wallencourt Valley to Lupart Wood. Before the main attack, the 4th Army was to advance northeastwards to capture a spur west of La Transloy and Bielancourt and north to the edge of the Thiloy Wallencourt Valley. Haig thought that if there was normal autumn weather, the objectives could be achieved but some restrictions on artillery ammunition consumption were imposed and more aircraft were requested from England. An attack on 1 October was to advance the left flank, capture O'Court and part of the flares line up to La Sars. The reserve army was to advance towards Puissieu, as the right flank met the attacks from the south bank at Mermont, enveloping German troops in the upper Anka Valley. The Third Army was to provide a flank guard north of the Reserve Army, by occupying a spur south of Gomcourt. Operations were to begin by 12 October, after the Fourth Army had attacked towards La Transloy and Bielancourt and the French Sixth Army had attacked Sayi Cell. The French Tenth Army south of the Somme was to attack on 10 October, north of Chorns. Chapter 2 Section 1 Subsection 2 Fourth Army The attack was to be conducted by three corps and the New Zealand Division of 15 Corps on the right flank, which was to advance its left, pivoting from a point in the Gird Trenches, 1,500 yards east of Ocourt. On the 29th of September, a day of rain and bright spells, the 6th Division and the Guards Division in 14 Corps on the right flank, took unopposed, some trenches east of Les Bouffes at 5.30 a.m. A company of the 8th Battalion York and Lancaster Regiment of the 23rd Division captured Distremont Farm and gained contact with the 2nd Canadian Division on the right flank of the Reserve Army later on, a battalion of the 47th Division began to bomb its way up Flair's Trench during the evening. On 30 September, the day was dull but dry, the battalion pushed the Germans back beyond Flair's, Switch Trench and a New Zealand battalion kept pace along Flair's support trench. Chapter 2 Section 2 German Defensive Preparations The Germans had built new defensive lines during the battle and the first two were called the Regal Eistelung slash Allenestelung, a double line of trenches and barbed wire several miles further back, as a new second line of defense along the ridge north of the Anka Valley, from Essets to Bukoy, west of Achi at Lepeti, Lupart Wood, south of Grevelers, west of Bapaum to La Transloy and Sii Sai Cell. On the reverse slope of that ridge, the Regal II Stellung slash Arminstellung ran from Abline Savelle to west of Lodge East Wood, west of Achiat Le Grand, the western outskirts of Bapaum, to Rockwiney, the Menil Enerases to Vaux Wood. Regal III Stellung branched from Regal II Stellung at Achiat Le Grand and ran clockwise around Bapaum, then south to Buni, Eaters, Nerlo and Tempelula Fossi. The first two German reserve lines had various British titles and the third line was known as the Buniators which dot from 25 September to the beginning of October, Ruprecht relieved the 6th Bavarian Division, 50th Reserve Division and the 52nd Reserve Division with the 7th Reserve Division, 6th Bavarian Reserve Division and 18th Reserve Division opposite the 4th Army, part of 13 fresh divisions installed opposite the British. From 30 September to 13 October, the six divisions from La Transloy to the Anka River were relieved by seven fresh divisions, two of which were then relieved by the 6th Division, 
2nd Bavarian Division, 19th Reserve Division, 28th Reserve Division, 24th Division, 40th Division, 4th Airsatz Division, 5th Airsatz Division and Marine Corps Vendern from the Belgian coast. From 24 October to 10 November, the seven divisions from La Transloy to the Anker were relieved, as was one of the fresh divisions, by the 38th Division, 222nd Division, Bavarian Airsatz Division, 4th Guard Division, 58th Division, 1st Guards Reserve Division, 23rd Reserve Division and the 24th Reserve Division. In mid-November, the Marine Brigade reinforced the Guard Reserve Corps near Wallen Court. Chapter 3 Battle. Chapter 3 Section 1, Fourth Army. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 2 The 1st of October. At 7 a.m., on a fine day, a deliberate bombardment began along the Fourth Army front and continued steadily until zero hour at 3.15 p.m. in the Gerd trenches on the right flank, captured during the preliminary operations, the Special Brigade re-fired at oil cylinders from 36 Livens projectors a minute before the infantry attack by the New Zealand Division on the left of 15 Corps. Thirty of the cylinders burst on target, enveloping the objective in flame and smoke. Despite the bombs, German machine gunners inflicted many casualties on the depleted 2nd Canterbury and 2nd Otago battalions of the 2nd New Zealand Brigade. The 2nd Canterbury captured quickly the Gerd trenches up to Goose Alley and the east end of Circus Trench, which was on a southwest line down to the Flares trenches. The second Otago attacked from Goose Alley and passed beyond the objective and the circus, an empty German strongpoint. The New Zealanders reorganized on the Labarque Road and with reinforcements consolidated a new line, in contact with the 47th Division near Abbey Road. The New Zealanders lost many of the 850 men still left during the attack and took 250 prisoners. On the right flank of the 3rd Corps area on the left flank of the 4th Army, the 47th Division attacked with three battalions of the 141st Brigade and two tanks. The 119th London Regiment got to within 50 yards of the German line, was forced under cover by machine gun fire and waited for the tanks. The tanks drove left along the flares trenches firing into them and the infantry captured the trenches easily, despite the many earlier casualties. As the support waves consolidated flares port trench, the leading infantry pressed on past Ocourt Labea, and met the New Zealanders at the Labarque Road. The 120th London attacked Ocourt and crossed the flares trenches after the two tanks as passed by, swept through Ocourt and gained touch with the 119th London. The tanks pressed on but bogged west of Ocourt, the 117th London on the left flank had already been stopped by uncut wire and German machine gun fire. During a counter-attack by part of 2 Battalion, Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment 17, the tanks were set on fire and abandoned. The 50th Division attacked with the 151st Brigade. On the right the 16th Durham Light Infantry was exposed by the repulse of the 117th London, had many casualties from German machine gun fire and was only able to capture a short length of Flair's trench. The 19th DLI came up from reserve and Bradford managed to organize another attack, capturing the rest of Flair's trench by 9.30 p.m. in the center, a composite battalion of the 15th Border, 18th DLI and the 15th Northumberland Fusiliers attached from the 149th Brigade on the left, benefited from an excellent barrage to advance and capture the flares trenches before the defenders could react. Dot on the left flank of 3 Corps, the 23rd Division attacked with the 70th Brigade. The 11th Sherwood Foresters and the 8th King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry assembled forward of their trenches, which were on a southeast line from Distremont Farm. On the right, the 11th Foresters captured Flair's trench and most of Flair's support then linked with the 151st Brigade. On the left, the 8th Coily faced determined resistance and only later was able to bomb the Germans back up Flair's trench and link with the 2nd Canadian Division on the Reserve Army boundary. The 9th York and Lanx went forward to reinforce and tried to probe Lassars but was repulsed by small arms fire from the houses. Communication with the rear broke down and the divisional and corps headquarters were not reliably informed of events until early on 2 October. 
The 47th Division headquarters realised that the 117th London had been repulsed and sent forward the tired and understrength 123rd London, which repeated the attack at 6.54 am, and was repulsed with 170 casualties. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 3 2-6 October During the night of 1-2 October, the Germans were forced out of Flair's support on the 50th Division front, where the 16th and 1th-9th DLI formed a flank guard on the right next to the 47th Division and defeated several German counterattacks, with hand grenades and Stokes mortar fire. It began to rain at 11 am and continued for the next two days. The 118th London relieved, the 117th London and at midday on 3 October, patrols reported that there were few Germans in the trenches opposite O'Court. The battalion advanced nearly unopposed northwest of the farm and gained touch with the 120th London on the right and the 68th Brigade of the 23rd Division, which had relieved the 50th Division Brigade. Opposite Lassars on the left, the 69th Brigade took over from the 70th Brigade and on 4 October, was repulsed in a pre-dawn attack up Flair's support to cross the albert Bapaume Road. The next 4th Army attack had been set for 5 October but the rains forced Rawlinson to postpone the attack until 7 October. The 6th Army agreed to the postponement so that the attacks of both armies would simultaneous. The 47th Division occupied the rest of Flair's support on 4 October and during the night of 5 October occupied the site of a mill to the northwest of O'Court. The 23rd Division attacked to capture Flair's support north of the Albert Bapaume Road at 6 pm on 4 October. A small party of the 10th Battalion Duke of Wellington's regiment cut through the barbed wire by hand and got a footing in the trench but retired after running out of grenades and ammunition. Two days later, the 11th Northumberland Fusiliers captured the tangle east of La Sars but found the area untenable and retired. The weather improved on 4 October, with high winds and little rain but low cloud made air observation difficult. On the 14th Corps front, it as was difficult to identify German outposts in trenches and derelict gun pits in front of the fortifications of Le Transloy, as it was for the British positions opposite. A high volume of German artillery retaliation when the preliminary bombardment began on 6 October, was maintained but caused few casualties to British troops waiting for zero hour at 1.45 pm. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 4 The 7th of October the 14th Corps objective was a trench line from 100 to 500 yards away and on the right flank the 56th Division attacked with two brigades. On the right, in the 168th Brigade area, the 114th Battalion London Scottish found it difficult to maintain contact with the French on the right, who advanced eastwards rather than northeast. The Scottish captured a southern group of gun pits and pushed on to the south end of Hazy Trench 200 yards beyond. The one-quarter London was stopped by machine gun fire from the northern gun pits and tried to outflank them on the right. On the left, the one-twelfth London advance was stopped short of Dewdrop Trench to the northeast of Les Bouffes, which had only been bombarded by Stokes mortars as it was too close to the British front line. In the 167th Brigade area, the 1 over 1 London was repulsed in front of Spectrum Trench except on the left flank where bombers joined with the 1 7th Middlesex, after it captured Rainbow Trench, the south end of Spectrum Trench against determined resistance. The 1 14th London Scottish and the 1 quarter London defeated a counter-attack, but after dark the battalions were forced back as were the French on the right dot in the 20th Division area two battalions of the 60th Brigade captured Rainbow Trench, shot at German troops who ran away and pressed on 150 yards to Misty Trench to gain touch with the 17th Middlesex on the right and the 61st Brigade on the left, which had reached its objective east of Good Court. After the 7th Coyley and the 12th King's Liverpool encountered a line of Germans advancing from Rainbow Trench to surrender. The battalions occupied Rainbow Trench and kept going to 300 yards to the southeast corner of Cloudy Trench. The 12th Division on the right of 15 Corps had not moved forward, so a defensive flank was formed on the left and a new trench dug from Cloudy Trench to the Beelan Court Road. About 350 yards of Rainbow Trench southeast of the road was still held by the Germans, 
who counter-attacked from Gulen Court at about 5 p.m. and were repulsed by small arms fire dot in the 15th Corps area, the objective was set 300 yards forward along the northwest end of Rainbow Trench and Bayonet Trench, up to the Gerd Trenches. Just before zero hour a German machine gun barrage began on the front trenches of the 12th Division and began an artillery bombardment, particularly on Gu Court, which held back the 37th Brigade on the right flank. The 6th Bluffs next to the 20th Division got into Rainbow Trench with too few survivors to consolidate it and retired. The 6th Royal West Kent on the left was stopped by the machine gun barrage as were the 9th and 8th Royal Fusiliers of the 36th Brigade on the left, the parties of the 8th Royal Fusiliers which got into Bayonet Trench being overwhelmed. In the 41st Division area on the left of 15 Corps, the German machine gun barrage stopped the 32nd and 26th Royal Fusiliers of the 124th Brigade halfway to Bayonet Trench. Parties reached the trench, where they were reinforced by the 21st KRRC and 10th Queens but by nightfall, the brigade had been reduced to a battalion of survivors. On the left flank, the 122nd Brigade used all four battalions who were also shot down. A Livens projector bombardment of burning oil on the Gerd lines failed but bombers from the 11th West Kent advanced a short way up both trenches. On the left flank, the divisional and corps boundary, the brigade got forward and linked with the 47th Division on the right of three corps dot in the 3rd Corps area, the 47th and 23rd Division objective required an advance of 500 yards, halfway into Lassars and then capture the rest of the village when the offensive began on the Butte de Wallencourt and the Gerd trenches up to the Flares trenches. The 47th Division attacked with the 140th Brigade to capture Snag Trench along the east slope of a dip towards Wallencourt, about 500 yards forward and halfway to the Butte. The 1/8th London on the right was stopped by a huge volume of machine gun fire, as were the 1/15th and 1th/7th London who were to pass through the 1/8th London and could only establish outposts near the Labarque Road, in touch with the 41st Division. The 23rd Division attacked on the right with the 12th DLI of the 68th Brigade, supported by a tank which attacked the German garrison in the Tangle and then turned left up the sunken road from Ocourt to Lassars, until hit by a shell. The 12th DLI was checked by machine gun fire down the road from the village but the 9th Green Howards of the 69th Brigade got into the southwest end. In the center, the 13th DLI was to capture the rest of the village and attacked at 230p.m. The battalion met the Green Howards at the village crossroads and after a determined resistance, the German defense collapsed. The 12th DLI had dug in along the sunken road beyond the tangle and pushed posts forward on the right flank. The 13th DLI and Green Howards dug posts around the village and prepared to advance on the Butte de Wallencourt but no reinforcements were available. 20 minutes after zero hour, the 11th Battalion West Yorkshire Regiment made a frontal attack on Flair's support trench north of Lassars but was stopped by artillery fire and small arms fire from the left flank. A second attempt succeeded, with bombers attacking along the trench from Lassars, retreating Germans being shot down by the British infantry and the divisional artillery. The 10th Duke of Wellington's arrived later and by dark, the 69th Brigade had occupied the Flares trenches to a point 300 yards inside the 4th Army boundary. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 5 The 8th of October The rain came back during the night and on the 8th of October the 4th Army divisions removed casualties and consolidated positions. On the left flank the 23rd Division attacked again at 4.50 a.m. with the Reserve Army. Two companies of the 8th York and Lanx from the 70th Brigade, captured the Flares trenches up to the army boundary and occupied an abandoned post 750 yards northwest of Lassars. The 47th Division made a night attack on Snag Trench with the 121st and 1th-22 ND London, by crawling forward to rush the trench as the barrage lifted. The trench was entered on the left but the parties were forced out by fire from the right. The 122nd London set up posts on the Ocourt Wall and Court Road and gained touch with the 23rd Division to the west. On the army boundary with the 6th Army, 
The 56th Division moved back from Rainy Trench northeast of Les Bouffes and most of Spectrum Trench to the north, for a British preparatory bombardment and then attacked at 3.30 p.m., with the 169th Brigade on the right. The 1-5th London captured Hazy Trench, despite losing contact with the French 18th Division on the right and machine guns concealed in shell holes stopped the 1-9th London and the 1-3rd London advance on Dewdrop and Spectrum trenches. After dark the battalions were withdrawn to the start line and German troops occupied Rainy Trench unopposed. Late on 8 October, Rawlinson ordered another attack, once 15 Corps had reached its objectives, anticipated to be by 12 October, when the 6th Army expected to have captured Csisl to the southeast. The rain stopped early on 9 October and from 10 to 11 October, the weather was fine but the state of the ground made divisional reliefs slow and laborious. From 8 to 11 October, the 14th Corps replaced the 56th and 20th Divisions with the 4th Division and the 6th Division. In 15 Corps the 41st Division was replaced by the 30th Division and the 9th Division and 15th Division took over from the 47th and 23rd Divisions in 3 Corps. The new division had little time to study the ground or dig assembly trenches and first was refused a 48-hour postponement. The Royal Flying Corps attempted to get new photographs of the German defences but the light was too poor for much to be achieved. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 6 The 12th of October Zero hour was 2.05 p.m. and the 4th Division on the right of 14 Corps attacked with the 10th Brigade next to the French 18th Division. The 1st Battalion, Royal Warwick advanced 500 yards and dug Antelope Trench south of Hazy Trench, gained touch with the French and repulsed a counter-attack in the evening. The battalion advance was repulsed at Rainy and Dewdrop trenches northeast of Les Bouffes, along with the 1st Royal Irish Fusiliers further to the left. On the left of the division the 12th Brigade attacked Spectrum Trench after a Stokes mortar bombardment, parties of the 2nd Duke of Wellington got into the trench and linked with the 2nd Lancashire Fusiliers in the north end of the trench. An attempt by groups from both battalions to attack over the spur to Zenith Trench was repulsed. In the 6th Division area north of the La Transloy Road, the 2nd York and Lancaster, on the right of the 16th Brigade was also repulsed in front of Zenith Trench. In the 71st Brigade area to the left, the 9th Suffolk in a salient form by Misty in the east end of Cloudy Trench were not to advance and in the 18th Brigade on the left of the division, the 1st West York's attack Mile Trench and the rest of Cloudy Trench by a frontal attack and a flank attack by bombers, which was repulsed. The 14th DLI on the left flank got into Rainbow Trench and bombed dugouts along the sunken Beulan Court Road, to link with the 1st West Yorks. On the left of the road the 14th DLI gained touch with the 88th Brigade detached from the 29th Division to the 12th Division on the right of 15 Corps. The Royal Newfoundland Regiment on the right, and the 1st Essex on the left, captured part of Hilt Trench and the extension of Rainbow Trench and then part of the 1st Essex pressed onto Greece Trench but were ordered back to the start line at 5.30 p.m., because the 35th Brigade on the left had not managed to get forward. The Newfoundlanders held on at Hilt Trench, bombed further up and took part of the 1st Essex objective. In the 35th Brigade attack, the 7th Suffolk and the 7th Norfolk tried to cut through barbed wire by hand opposite bayonet trench against massed, small arms fire, after which the survivors were pinned down until dark and then retreated. The 30th Division attacked on the left of 15 Corps with the 2nd Royal Scots Fusiliers and the 17th Manchester of the 90th Brigade. The Royal Scots managed only to advance 150 yards into machine gun fire and then withdrew as some parties of the 17th Manchester got into bayonet trench before retiring. On the left of the division, the 89th Brigade attacked on the right with the 2nd Bedfordshire, which tried to bomb up the Gird trenches but were only able to take a small length of bite trench. On the left, the 7th King's Liverpool was stopped by enfilade fire from the northwest the preliminary bombardment having failed to suppress the German machine guns, which were dispersed over a wide area dot in the 3rd Corps area the 9th Division on the right had to capture Snag Trench, then the Butte de Wallencourt and the Wallencourt line. 
The tail ran back from Snag Trench to the Butte and the Pimple at the west end of Snag Trench, with the help of enfilade fire from the 15th Division to the left. Little Wood and the Butte were bombarded with smoke by four special company re. In the 26th Brigade on the right, the 7th Seaforth Highlanders was caught by machine gun fire as soon as it attacked and with the reinforcement of the 10th Argyles managed only to push on for 200 yards and dig in during the night. On the left flank the 1st South African Brigade attacked with the 2nd Regiment followed by the 4th Regiment, which were held up by long-range machine gun fire and lost direction in the smoke drifting from the Butte. Parties dug in halfway to Snag Trench and some stayed in no man's land until the following morning. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 714-17 October After the poor results of the attack on the 12th of October, Rawlinson concluded that the weather delays had enabled the defenders to recover and that a deliberate attack after methodical bombardment was necessary, before another attack on the 18th of October. On the 13th of October, he issued an operation order in which he stressed the necessity of improving routes to the front line and the preparation of good assembly trenches parallel to the German defences. A steady bombardment was to begin immediately and 14 corps was warned to capture Zenith, Mild and the rest of Cloudy Trenches, before the general attack. Fifteen corps was to capture the Gerd lines southeast of the Ocourt Labarc Road and Snag Trench was to be captured by three corps, all by night attacks supported by tanks, where practical. On the 14th of October, the 14th Corps attempted a surprise attack at 6.30 pm with the 2nd Seaforth of the 4th Division, which got into Rainy Trench and gun pits south of Dewdrop Trench and were then forced out by a counter-attack. The 2nd Royal Dublin Fusiliers tried to capture gun pits in front of Hazy Trench at the same time and were also repulsed out in the 12th Brigade, the 1st King's Own tried to bomb down Spectrum Trench to Dewdrop Trench in the evenings of 14 and 15 October and in a pre-dawn attack on 15 October, the 2nd Sherwood Foresters in the 6th Division took the gun pits in front of the British-held section of Cloudy Trench and took several prisoners. On the left of the division the 11th Essex overran Mild Trench and bombed up the Court Road before being forced back by a counter-attack. In the 3rd Corps area, the 3rd South African Regiment attacked after dark on 14 October, captured the Pimple and 80 yards of Snag Trench. The rain gradually abated, and the 17th of October began fair but clouded over and rain fell again during the night. The British bombardment had continued as planned but the German artillery reply was vigorous leading up to zero hour at 3.40 am on 18 October. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 8 18-20 October On most of the brigade fronts, assembly positions had been marked with white tape and compass bearings taken of the direction to the objectives but at zero hour, the British positions were flooded. The moon was obscured by low clouds, troops slipped and fell in the mud and weapons were clogged, leaving only hand grenades and bayonets with which to fight. On the right the 4th Division attacked with the 11th Brigade to take Frosty, Hazy, Rainy and Dewdrop trenches, while in the French sector the attack began at 11.45 am groups of the 1st Rifle Brigade reached the gun pits before Hazy Trench and were forced back, the 1st East Lanks were forced under cover in front of Dewdrop Trench, by the fire of hidden machine guns. The 1st King Zone of the 12th Brigade and the German defenders mutually attacked and counter-attacked around Spectrum Trench and then the King Zone bombed along Spectrum for 70 yards towards Dewdrop Trench. In the 6th Division, the 9th Norfolk attacked mild and cloudy trenches but was bombarded before zero hour and moved so slowly through mud that it lost the barrage. The battalion captured the northwest end of mild trench and then repulsed a counter-attack as dark fell. The 15th Corps made flank attacks because the center faced a dip either side of the Flares Thilloy Road. The 12th Division on the right attacked Greece Trench with the 2nd Hampshire and 4th Worcester Battalions and the southeast end of Bayonet Trench with the 9th Essex Battalion from the 35th Brigade. The 2nd Hampshire and the 4th Worcester took Greece Trench with few losses but then had many casualties trying to press on. The Worcester blocked Hilt Trench on the left after the 9th Essex were not able to advance, except for one company which got into Bayonet Trench and was then bombed out by counter-attacks from the flanks. 
On the left of the 30th Division the 2nd Green Howards almost reached the west end of Bayonet Trench before being stopped by showers of hand grenades. Parties bombed up part of Bike Trench but reinforcements were stopped from moving up by the mud. On the left the 18th Kings and 2nd Wiltshire attacked the Gird lines and found uncut wire on the right and enfiladed from the left, most of the 2nd Wiltshire being killed, dot, two tanks had been brought up to flares in case the night attacks failed and during a lull at 8 am one bogged in mud and the other drove to the end of Gird trench and machine gunned it for 20 minutes, killing many Germans who ran back to the northeast. The commander signalled the infantry to move up but the infantry were so disorganised and exhausted that none moved. The tank drove along Gerd trench to the Labarque road and then returned. Three corps attacked Snag trench again and as smoke and lacrimatory bombs were fired from the 15th Division front to try to suppress German fire from the Butte and from Wallencourt village. The 5th Cameron Highlanders, on the right of the 9th Division, took a trench from the Labarque Road to 200 yards from the nose and met some of the 2nd Wiltshire. A German counter-attack on the right got a footing in the trench, until another attack after dark drove them back and on the left two companies of the 1st South African Regiment overran Snag Trench, pressed on and were shot down by machine gun fire from the Butte, apart from a small group, who got into Snag Trench next to the Cameron. At dawn the South Africans tried to bomb along Snag from the Pimple and at 5.45pm attacked from both flanks. The South Africans managed to advance, leaving the Germans occupying only 100 yards of the trench around the nose as night fell. The rain continued during the 19th of October, at dawn, German parties accompanied by a Flammenwerfer detachment advanced along the tail to attack eastwards along Snag Trench. The South Africans retreated towards the 8th Black Watch which had relieved the Cameron, as a counter-attack on the right flank was repulsed. British artillery maintained the bombardment on the nose and tail areas but the South African Brigade was too exhausted to attack again, and after dark the 27th Brigade took over all the 9th Division front, struggling through mud and water. The 6th King's own Scottish borderers was considered fit to attack at 4 p.m. on 20 October and in confused fighting, captured, lost and retook the nose. By dark the 6th Cosford had control of Snag Trench and some Royal Scots had advanced along 250 yards of the tail. Chapter 3 Section 2, German 1st and 2nd Armies Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 2 1-3 October in the early autumn, many German divisions which had fought earlier on the Somme were brought back for a second period, in which their performance was considered inferior, despite replacements being of good quality, because of the lack of experienced NCOs and junior officers. The 6th Bavarian Reserve Division took over the defences of Ocourt Labea on 26 September and suffered many casualties to artillery fire. On 1 October, Prisoners taken from Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment, 21 of the division said that Brandbomben had caused much damage. Briar 21 recorded the capture of the 2 and 3 Battalion headquarters and that attempts to counterattack failed. The 2nd Battalion, Briar 17 counterattacked southeast down the Flares trenches past two bogged down tanks but hoped to recover O Court were abandoned during the afternoon. The 3rd Battalion, Briar 17 reassembled on the Ocourt Lassars Road on 2 October and was joined by 3 Battalion, Briar 16 and parties of Infantry Regiment 362 of the 4th Airsatz Division garrisoned the village. On the night of 2 3 October, Briar 21 was relieved near Ocourt by Briar 16 but the fresh troops were unable to prevent the loss of Ocourt. The infantry were ground down by the weather conditions and British attacks. The commander of I Battalion, Briar 16 reported that battlefield conditions were extraordinary, with cold food and artillery fire causing severe problems, particularly short shooting by German guns, the high number of casualties having depressed morale, made worse by the lack of opportunity to remove the bodies strewn around trenches and tracks. Poor hygiene caused many non-battle casualties, with 25-33% to of the men having severe diarrhea. The report was sent to the regiment commander who could only pass it on. By the 3rd of October, 
The 4th Airzatz Division had relieved the 7th Division west of the Bapaume Road and took over the Bavarian right up to Lassars, by when Briar 17 casualties had risen to 1,646 men. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 3 7 to 8 October On the night of 6-7 of October, Infantry Regiment 68 of the 16th Division and Reserve Infantry Regiment 76 of the 17th Reserve Division relieved IR 163 at the Sayasals, both regiments having fought against the British on the Somme earlier in the battle. The troops of the 16th Division had spent several days digging part of our two stellung by day and night in the rain, after marching 9.3 miles from bivouacs in muddy fields, without means of getting dry, before receiving the order to move forward to the front line. On the 10th of October, another order came that the division would not be relieved for some time and must keep troops in reserve back in R. I. Stellung. The front line was hard to define and led IR-68 and Rear-76 to argue over the inter-regimental boundary, French attacks and artillery fire had already made the southern approach to the village untenable. The troops were encouraged by the evidence of the greater effort in the air being made over the Somme, reporting that the aerial plague was less intense than during their first tour. The 18th Reserve Division relieved the 52nd Reserve Division in late September and Reserve Infantry Regiment 84 on the left of the division lost 70 prisoners on 7 October. The British 20th Division took prisoners from Reserve Infantry Regiment 72 on the Goucourt Bulancourt Road and Reserve Infantry Regiment 66 to the left. Reserve Infantry Regiments 36 and 72 lost prisoners at Rainbow Trench. Snag Trench was held by 3 Battalion, Briar 16 of the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division. From 7 to 8 October, the British took 528 prisoners from Infantry Regiments 360, 361, 362 of the 4th Airzatz Division, the I Battalion, Infantry Regiment 360 having been attacked, during a relief by 3 Battalion, Infantry Regiment 360. The 47th Division captured 84 prisoners of Reserve Infantry Regiment 31 and 84 of the 18th Reserve Division. Rear 86 had moved left to close a gap made by the French, which moved Rear 31 opposite the British right flank. In the 16th Division area opposite the French, IR-68 and IR-28 made, several counter-attacks against French troops who had reached the church in CE, greatly helped by the German artillery which inflicted many French losses before the fighting closed to hand-to-hand. -to -hand. The new tactic of holding the front line with the minimum of men increased the burden on German artillery, which had to commence firing as soon as the French or British attacked but the extent of allied artillery fire forced the gunners to rely on flares from the front line instead of telephones. A field gun regiment at the nerlo peron moislanes temple la fosse crossroads covered the defences of St. Pierre Vastwood, 3.1 to 3.7 miles away, from open positions vulnerable to French shelling. The distance from the wood was too great for observed fire and when shooting from the map, shell dispersion made for a large beaten zone, which was impossible to correct and guaranteed that some shells fell short onto German positions, regardless of careful fire control and gun laying. Steel was being used instead of brass for shell cases which caused stoppages but the still managed to fire 2,200 to 4,700 shells per day. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 4 The 12th of October the 16th Division of the Saisals repulsed several attacks in the morning and then received a bombardment of staggering intensity, before the French attacked again. Infantry Regiment 68 lost another 102 casualties but held on with IR-76 which was relieved that night. Liaison between the Bavarians and the 16th Division was poor and both regiments argued about responsibility for a gap between them. The companies of the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division on the Bapaume Albert Road opposite the British, were down to about 35 men each, all suffering from dysentery, exhaustion, hunger and exposure, to hold an area of 1,100 yards times 1,600 yards. Reserve Infantry Regiment 31 recorded many losses at Zenith Trench. 
The 19th Reserve Division had relieved the 7th Reserve Division and on the right the 6th Division had moved up and taken over the left of the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division opposite the 3rd Corps of the British 4th Army. Reserve Infantry Regiment 92 of the 19th Reserve Division was opposite the left of the British 6th Division. About 150 prisoners were taken from Infantry Regiment 64 of the 6th Division during the loss of Hill Trench, the left flank being rolled up. A counterattack stopped the British advance but contact with Reserve Infantry Regiment 92 of the 19th Reserve Division on the left was lost. Dot Infantry Regiment 24 of the 6th Division and parts of Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiments 16 and 21 of the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division were opposite the 30th Division. Snag Trench was held by Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment 20. After the fighting on the 12th of October, the 2nd Bavarian Division relieved the 18th Reserve Division, the 40th Division relieved the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division on the night of 12-13 October and the 24th Division took over from the 4th Ersatz Division. On the 12th of October, men of the German 15th Division refused orders to move up to the front line. French attacks were made in the afternoons after artillery bombardments and on the 14th of October, IR-68 found that half its casualties had been caused by German artillery firing short. The dispute about regimental boundaries continued and on 15 October the French found the gap and got into Saïcelle. Several determined counterattacks were made to eject them but by 17 the October the counterattacks had failed. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 5 18-20 October the rest of the Saisels had been held and the German hold on St. Pierre Vast would stop the French from rolling up the German defences from north to south. The 4th Division took prisoners from Bavarian Infantry Regiment, 15 of the 2nd Bavarian Division and the 2nd Battalion, Bavarian Infantry Regiment 15 had 50% casualties. Most of Reserve Infantry Regiment 92 was captured and Infantry Regiment 64 of the 6th Division lost 200 men of the I Battalion. Infantry Regiment 181 of the 40th Division found that the mud reduced the effect of the British bombardment and the infantry were unable to make a quick advance. Prisoners were taken from 1 and 2 battalions, Infantry Regiment 104 at Snag Trench and the 3rd Battalion conducted a counterattack. On 19 October, the Storm Detachment of the 40th Division counterattacked in two columns with flame throwers, a machine gun section and the best men of I Battalion, Infantry Regiment 104, the advance of the left column was halted by one of the flame throwers exploding. Most of the survivors of Infantry Regiment 104 were relieved by 3 Battalion, Infantry Regiment 134. The trenches of Infantry Regiment 104 were smashed by artillery fire and the troops were withdrawn, according to the new policy, of avoiding pointless casualties by abandoning outposts of no tactical value. Chapter 3 Section 2 Subsection 6 The 24th of October Ruprecht wrote in his diary that the recapture of the north end of CE was needed to regain artillery observation but that this would have to wait for the arrival of the 15th Corps with the 30th and 39th Divisions. Below and the commander of the 9th Reserve Corps, General Max von Born, had agreed that the power of resistance of the Germans on the Somme was much reduced and that officer casualties meant that it could not be increased. The French First Offensive Battle of Verdun temporarily stopped the flow of reinforcements to the Somme front but substantial artillery and air reinforcements were already on the Somme. The decline in the power of the Anglo-French artillery caused by poor weather and Luftstreitkraft attacks on artillery observation machines, enabled the German infantry to mount a costly but successful defense, helped by the knowledge that the onset of winter would end the battle. Chapter 3 Section 3 Air operations. By October, the Germans had managed to assemble about 333 aircraft in 23 squadrons from Peron to Hanniskamps, 17 Felflieger Abteilungen with about 100 reconnaissance aircraft, 13 artillery flights with about 53 aircraft, 3 bomber fighter squadrons, and 2 independent flights with about 140 aeroplanes to escort them, mainly of C type, 2 seater armed biplanes and three fighter squadrons with about 45 aircraft. Jagdstaffel II Hauptmann Oswald Bulker, 
had been established at Burton Court on the 27th of August and on the 16th of September, received new Albatross DI and E2 fighters. The concentration of aircraft, particularly the superior fighters, enabled the Germans to challenge Anglo-French air superiority, at least for short periods. Barrage fights to stop aircraft crossing the German lines were ended and airmen were ordered over the Anglo-French lines instead, to fight through to their objectives in large formations. Aircraft with more powerful engines, that could climb higher than British fighters had arrived in August and managed to photograph the battlefield. More balloon units arrived, which eventually had 50 balloons, half of those on the Western Front and all of the light motorized anti-aircraft guns in the army were sent to the Somme. Methodical observation of artillery fire and the reforms introduced by Golvitz, made bombardments more efficient and German infantry began to recover confidence in the air arm. On 6 October, the Imperial German Flying Corps was reformed as the Luftstreitkraft. Chapter 3 Section 3 Subsection 2 1-11 October During September, the monthly wastage in RFC fighters and long-range reconnaissance aircraft was 75% and the new faster, more maneuverable German fighters coming into service, threatened Anglo-French air superiority on the Somme. At 3 p.m. on 1 October, observers of 34 Squadron and 3 Squadron watched the attack by 3 Corps and the New Zealand Division of 15 Corps on Ocourt Labea and the defences either side, on a 3,000 yards front. The attack on Ocourt failed but on the rest of the attack front the infantry followed a good barrage onto their objectives and were also able to send patrols into La Sars. The commander of 34 Squadron, Major John Chamier reported that. At 3.15 p.m. the steady bombardment changed into a most magnificent barrage, the barrage appeared to be the most perfect wall of fire in which it was inconceivable that anything could live. The 50th Division, were seen to spread out from the sapheads and forming up trenches and advance close up under the barrage, apparently some 50 yards away from it. They appeared to capture their objective very rapidly and with practically no losses while crossing the open. To sum up, the most startling feature of the operations as viewed from the air was the extraordinary volume of fire of our barrage and the straight line kept by it, the apparent ease with which the attack succeeded where troops were enabled to go forward close under it. The promiscuous character and comparative lack of volume of the enemy's counter-barrage. Two Corps of the Reserve Army on the left of three Corps, had attacked at 3 p.m. but was repulsed by a huge amount of German artillery fire and frequent counter-attacks. In three hours, RFC observers sent down 67 zone calls to the 2nd Corps counter-battery group and 39 batteries were reported by observers in balloons. On 2 October, Continuous rain began and eight German aircraft flew low over the British lines between Morville and Lesbouffs, where one was shot down by ground fire, while the British aircraft were on the ground. On 6 October, German aircraft had reconnoitred and several strafed troops of 15 Corps. The 4th Army attacked again on 7 October in dull and windy weather and the German airmen returned to the British artillery lines near Flares and Goodcourt and directed German counter-battery fire onto the British guns. British fighter pilots from 4 Brigade were sent to the scene but the Germans had gone by the time they arrived. RFC observers watched the British attack but the strong westerly wind made their aircraft appear to be stationary in the air when the pilots turned into the wind to allow the observers to study the ground. German infantry fired on the aircraft, two crew were wounded and several aircraft had to be flown back to make emergency landings. Rawlinson complained that the quality of the reconnaissance reports, which with the lack of observation during the rain delays before the attack, led to the British bombardments and barrages being inaccurate, which contributed to the failure of the 4th Army except east of Goodcourt and at Lassars. The German counter-barrage had been prompt and accurate, helped by the success of the reconnaissance flights before the attack. On 9 October, German aircraft bombed the rear areas of 3 Corps at 11.20 pm and within minutes four pilots from 18 Squadron and 21 Squadron, were dispatched to raid illuminated aerodromes from which the bombers had come but none were seen, Cambrai station and villages around Bapaume were bombed instead. 
A train hit earlier by 13 Squadron, which had also bombed Bapaum and Quaint stations, was hit again. Next day the weather improved and every British offensive patrol was attacked, SOP with one and a half strutters from 70 Squadron fought seven German fighters over their airfield at Velu, other British aircraft joined in but found it impossible to keep the German aircraft in their sights because of their maneuverability. The German aircraft eventually flew away after one aeroplane each was shot down, three more German aircraft were lost and a British aircraft was shot down into the British lines near Morville from which the crew escaped. Another aeroplane force landed at Pozieres and a 23 Squadron F.E.2B crashed into a shell hole with a dead pilot. During the night, 18, 19 and 13 squadrons bombed Cambrai and Vitry stations and the aerodrome at Douai. Chapter 3 Section 3 Subsection 3 12 to 21 October On the 12th of October, the 4th Army attack was repulsed except near Goodcourt, partly because of a lack of air observation, which led to an inadequate preparatory bombardment. The weather remained bad until 16 October when three aircraft of 18 Squadron bombed Cambrai Station, one of which was shot down as they returned. German aircraft also bombed the airfield of 9 Squadron, wounding two ground staff and destroying one aeroplane and damaged another. 7B-12s of 19 Squadron bombed Hermes Station and the airfield in the morning, then Havrincourt and Ruyorcourt in the afternoon, losing two aircraft. The reconnaissance and artillery observation aircraft of four and five brigades flew many sorties against much German fighter opposition. A 15 squadron aircraft was attacked by five fighters near Hebertern and shot down and another aircraft was attacked over Wallencourt and returned with a wounded observer. Four brigade offensive patrols lost one aircraft and had one pilot wounded, shooting down three German aircraft. Another was shot down by a V Brigade offensive patrol. The better weather continued on the 17th of October, and a supply dump was blown up at Bapaume Station. A reconnaissance by Third Army aircraft at the north end of the Somme front met 20 German fighters, and two aircraft were shot down by each side. A British aircraft was driven down by German fighters, and two German aircraft were forced down by 24 Squadron near Velu. Rain and sleet then stopped flying for two days. On 20 October, aircraft of 11 Squadron on photographic reconnaissance near Douai, were attacked by Jasta II, which shot down two aircraft and damaged two more. 33 German aircraft crossed the British front line and, and made many attacks on British aircraft, three German aircraft were shot down and 17 claimed damaged. German night bombers attacked Quiriu, Corby, and Lono, where an ammunition wagon was blown up, British aircraft attacked Velu and Peron. Quaint Station was bombed by 30 aircraft and escorts and one bomber was shot down. After the bombers reached British lines, one of the escorting Newport 17s turned back but was forced down in a dogfight with a faster German aircraft. On other parts of the Somme front two German aircraft were shot down, three damaged and ten driven down. Chapter 3 Section 3 Subsection 422 October to November On the 22nd of October there were many sorties by German flyers. Six aircraft attacked a one and a half strutter of 45 squadron and wounded the observer, who shot one down. Later in the day, three 45 squadron aircraft were shot down and an F.E.2B shot down one aircraft and damaged another, before the observer was mortally wounded, four British aircraft were shot down beyond German lines. During the 23rd of October, two Reserve Army artillery observation aeroplanes were shot down by JASTA II. On the 26th of October, despite poor weather both sides flew many sorties, a fight between 5 Echo DH.2S of 24 Squadron, and 20 Halberstadt D.2s was indecisive but later in the day, eight aircraft led by Balker, shot down one British observation aircraft, forced down two more and a British fighter which intervened. One German fighter was then shot down when a formation of British fighters from 32 Squadron turned up. Bulker was killed on 28 October, when he collided with a German aircraft, during an attack on two British fighters, which returned safely. For the rest of the Battle of the Somme, both sides flew in rain, mist, 
sleet and westerly gales, often at dangerously low heights, to direct artillery and attack troops with guns and bombs. The 3rd of November was a clear day and German aircraft shot down five British aircraft. On the night of the 6th of November German night bombers hit an ammunition train near Cerisi, which exploded next to a cage for German prisoners of war and devastated the area. Better weather came on the 8th of November and many German aircraft made ground attacks on British troops, a tactic which the Luftstreitkraft began to incorporate systematically into its defensive operations. The British attempted to divert German attention next day, with bombing raids on Arlieu and Vraucourt. The raid on Vraucourt by 12 bombers and 14 escorts became the biggest air fight of the war, when approximately 30 German aircraft attacked the formation as it crossed the front lines. Most of the bombs were dropped over the target but six British aircraft were shot down and three German aircraft were claimed. Three more British aircraft were shot down later in the day, one pilot was killed, one wounded and an observer were wounded in aircraft which returned. The railway station at Vitry and German airfields at Bissy, Velu and Villers were attacked after dark, while German night bombers attacked the airfield at Lavieville. The British attacked Valenciennes Aerodrome next morning, where five parked aircraft, hangars and sheds were bombed. Next day, German air operations were less extensive, three aircraft were shot down and three damaged for the loss of one British aeroplane. Naval 8 drove down two German aircraft on 10 November and overnight 18 squadron retaliated for the attack on their airfield at Lavieville by bombing Valenciennes, Velu, transport on the Bapaume Road, balloon sheds, a train near St. Liga and a second train which was set on fire, a German headquarters at Havrincourt Chateau and Douai Aerodrome were also attacked. German bombers attacked Amiens Station and returned on the night of 10-11 of November, when one aircraft was forced down with engine trouble and the crew captured. Chapter 3 Section 4 Flank Operations Chapter 3 Section 4 Subsection 2 Tenth Army The Tenth Army attacked from 10 to 11, 14 and 21 to 22 October during the Battle of La Transloy, after being reinforced by the 21st Corps and the 2nd Colonial Corps. On 10 October the army attacked on a 6.2 miles front in the centre of the army area towards Pressois, Ablaincourt, and Fresnes. The French captured the German second position around Ablaincourt and took about 1,400 prisoners but south of Estrees, the attack by the 51st Division on Chorns was contained in Bois 4 to the northwest. On 14 October, an attack by the 10th Colonial Division and two other divisions on the left flank, next to the 6th Army boundary, captured the trenches opposite and took about 1,000 prisoners, the French then paused, to consolidate the ground around Ablaincourt, which had turned into a vast lake of mud and repulsed several German counter-attacks. The army began preparations for an attack later in October to capture the Butte de Fren and cut the Chorns Peron railway but the weather, the state of the ground, Exhaustion of the infantry and the increased powers of resistance of the German Second Army slowed the French advance. The Tenth Army had failed to advance on the northern flank against Barlieu in the Sixth Army area, where the 33rd Corps on both sides of the Somme had attacked again in the south on the 18th of October to counter German mining and improve the line from La Maisonette north to Bayaches. An attack to clear the approaches to the higher ground on which lay Villas Carbonel and Friend to the southeast was forestalled on 29 October, when the Germans bombarded La Maisonette for eight hours with high explosive, gas and lacrimatory shell and then the 206th Division attacked with Infantry Regiment 359. A battalion of the 97th Infantry Regiment was overrun and 450 prisoners taken, which left a gap in the French line for several days and the attack on Barlieu had to be cancelled. On the right flank of the army, the 51st Division was unable to advance further in Bois 4 on the 11th of October. During the night a counter-attack by German storm troops and a flamethrower detachment destroyed a battalion of the 25th Regiment and a French attack on the 21st of October, began a period of local attacks and counter-attacks which lasted into November. Chapter 3 Section 4 Subsection 3 Sixth Army The Sixth Army attacked on 7, 12-13, 
15 and the 18th of October. Opposite the 6th Army, R.I. Stellung the 4th German defensive position built on the Somme, ran along a dip at the top of the shallow valley between the Saisels and Le Transloy, in front of which the sunken road from Le Transloy to the mortal Saisel Road, known as Banisco and Tours Trenches, had also been fortified. On the right flank of the attack, the Saisels were covered by the Prilic to the Ports de Fern negotiation line just east of Rancourt, which met the west end of St. Pierre Vastwood at Royce Trench and the Carlsbad, Turplitz and Berlin trenches about 2,200 yards further back. A strong point around Boys Tripot and Chateau C.E. Saisel covered the southern approaches to the villages. The villages were bombarded by super-heavy 270mm, 280mm and 370mm mortars ready for the attack on the 7th of October when the 4th Army to the north attacked. Equals chapter 3 section 4 subsection 4 the 7th of October equals. In the center, the I Corps captured the line from Prilip to Ports to Fur to Negotian in early October and on the 7th of October, the 40th Division captured Turplitz and Berlin trenches, formed a flank on the southwest fringe of St. Pierre Vastwood and gained a small part of Royce Trench. The 56th Division to the left managed to advance 1,300 yards up the slope west of the Saisels, captured Carlsbad Trench and gained a footing in the Bois Tripot strongpoint beyond, which gave the French observation of the ground towards the peron Palm Road and the Saisels. The attack was the most successful on the north side of the Somme but fell far short of Roquigny and on the left flank I Corps, which had been in the line since August was relieved by the 9th Corps ready for the next attack on 12 October. On the right flank, the attack of the 33rd Corps south of Bouchavains from 6 to 7 October failed, due to an ineffective bombardment and offensive operations were suspended for the winter. Equals Chapter 3 Section 4 Subsection 5 12 to 18 October equals. In the second week of October, the 32nd Corps took over the right flank of I Corps and on 12 October, the Corps got into Sayi Saïsel but was forced out by German counter-attacks. On 15 October, the 66th Division exploited a crushing bombardment to capture the remainder of Boy's Tripot, Chateau Saïsel, the 152nd Infantry Regiment, and the 68th Battalion Chasseurs au Pour infiltrated between Prussian, and Bavarian positions and spent the next six days fighting hand-to-hand -hand in the ruins. The 94th Infantry Regiment of the 66th Division held on against several German counter-attacks around the peron Palm and Seisaisel to Moise Lane's crossroads up to 29 October. On the right flank, the 32nd Corps chasseurs gained a foothold in Royce Trench but more attacks to capture the east side of Seisaisel were postponed because of bad weather until 5 November and took until 12 November to complete. The 18th Division of 9 Corps attack on Bukovina Trench failed as did several later attacks and Fiol sacked Pentel, despite the careful training he had given the Corps before it entered the line. The 18th Division reported afterwards that ground observation posts had only a partial view over the trench, air observation was limited by frequent fog, rain and high winds. The French approach was up a 2,200-yard slope, full of shell craters and mud dotted with hidden machine gun nests, dominated by German artillery, and observation aircraft. French light machine guns jammed and the infantry struggled through knee-high mud. On 17 October an attack on Banisca Trench failed when the French barrage fell short onto the 32nd Infantry Regiment, as it waited for zero hour in an advanced, jumping-off trench. The German counter-bombardment caught the support waves in the French front line and the advanced troops were caught in crossfire from machine gun nests up in front of Banisca Trench. The troops furthest forward were forced under cover, short of the trench and those on the flanks were unable to advance which left the 32nd Infantry Regiment in a salient and bombarded by their artillery again, losing 130 casualties in the attack. Banisca Trench was eventually captured by the 152nd Division on 1 November, after Fiol overruled Andrea and insisted on an attack, which apparently surprised the Germans, who did think that one could occur in such abysmal conditions. Chapter 3 Section 4 Subsection 6 Reserve Army 
The Reserve Army continued its attacks from Kusilet near the Albert Bapaume Road, west to Thiepel on Bosonton Ridge. The Reserve Army attacked on 1, 8, 21 and 25 October. Many smaller attacks were also made between frequent rainstorms, which turned the ground and roads into rivers of mud and grounded aircraft. German forces at the east end of Storfenriegel and in the remaining parts of Schrobinfester to the north and Stuff Redoubt northeast of Thiepel, fought a costly defensive battle but Stuff Redoubt was captured on 9 October and the last German position in Schrobin Redoubt fell on 14 October, exposing German positions in the Anker Valley to British ground observation. A retreat up the Anker Valley was contemplated by Ludendorff and Ruprecht but rejected. Due to the lack of better defensive positions further back, in favor of counterattacks desired by below the first army commander. Golvitz noted in early October, that so many of his units had been transferred north of the Somme, that he had only one fresh regiment left in reserve. The German counterattacks were costly failures and by 21 October, the British had advanced 500 yards and taken all but the last German foothold in the eastern part of Storfenriegel. From 29 October to 9 November, British attacks were postponed due to rain and fog. Chapter 4, Aftermath Chapter 4 Section 1, Analysis Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 2 Wilfred Miles In 1938, Wilfred Miles, the British official historian, wrote that by 12 October, the Germans were used to afternoon attacks, British battalions were at half strength with only 400 men, many being poorly trained recruits. Lacking air observation for reconnaissance and artillery observation in the poor weather, the infantry had struggled to advance towards German defences. The German machine guns had been moved back to concealed positions beyond the depth of the British barrages, to sweep the attack front from long range. Rawlinson decided that the German defences would have to be subjected to a methodical bombardment and that the infantry must prepare more routes of supply from the rear and dig assembly trenches parallel to their objectives, Cavan suggested beginning a creeping barrage just beyond objectives and firing lots of smoke shells to hamper German observation but none were available. By mid-October, air reconnaissance was impossible because of rain and mist and artillery observation could not be conducted on any great scale. Shell bursts were smothered, guns became too worn for accurate fire and sank into the mud, the supply of ammunition was slowed by the condition of the ground and German bombardments. After the results of the attack on the 18th of October were known, the scope of the offensive was reduced and then washed out by more rain until 3 November. Cavan objected to more attacks on La Transloy, except from the south, 14 corps having already suffered 5,320 casualties. Rawlinson and then Haig had agreed to stop the attack but changed their minds when the French insisted on an attack by the 6th Army. 14 corps was ordered to make a local attack to the east and northeast of Les Bouffes and the French told that only a general pressure would be exerted by rest of the 4th Army. On 6 November, attacks were only to be made to stop the Germans from moving troops from the Western Front, and to support the attacks of the 6th Army. Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 3 Andrew Simpson In 1995, Simpson wrote that the inability of the British artillery adequately to respond to the changes of German tactics may have been caused by the supply difficulties in October, when the gunners lacked the ammunition to extend creeping barrages all the way to the far side of German defences. Guns were worn out, ammunition had three types of propellant with inconsistent characteristics, all the ammunition was damp and corrections for atmospheric conditions were insufficient to regain accuracy, without observation of targets or information on the fall of shot from artillery observation aircraft. In 2001, Simpson described the process of forming plans by the 4th Army headquarters to be one of consultation and negotiation with corps commanders, provided that decisions were compatible with the corps artillery plan, which was derived from the Army plan. Corps then set boundaries and let divisional commanders have discretion within them. By October Corps headquarters were aware of the importance of passing information from contact patrol aircraft and other sources forward to divisions, the Corps headquarters developing into information clearing houses by the end of the battle. 
Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 4 Gary Sheffield In 2003, Sheffield described the tactical conditions on the Fourth Army Front in similar terms to that of Wilfred Miles, the official historian and that attacks continued in mud, which slowed movement to a crawl and in which had taken ten hours to move an Australian brigadier to a dressing station. Charles Bean, the Australian official historian called the conditions the worst ever known to the first A. I. F. Sheffield wrote that Haig was in a coalition straitjacket with the French as the senior partners, which other writers, and historians had underestimated. Joffrey had wanted another offensive towards Bertincourt, Bapaum and Achiet Le Grand and the Sixth Army continued its attack, which Haig felt bound to support. Sheffield wrote that Philpott's view that Haig continued the offensive in the broader interests of the alliance, was correct. In 2011, Sheffield wrote that the new German defences built behind the third position in the onset of autumn required a series of bite and hold attacks, which were beyond the ability of the British to arrange in time to reach open country. In late September, Haig had ordered an ambitious three army offensive operation toward Cambrai, but despite showing increasing tactical skill and inflicting many losses on the Germans, the territorial gains were miserly. Haig persisted because he believed that attrition was working, the British expeditionary force was improving, and that he overestimated the capacity of the armies in a wet and muddy season. The pressure from Joffrey to continue was also significant and Haig wrote sympathetically of Cavan's protest in November, but that the French could not be left in the lurch. In late October Haig reminded Joffrey that although subordinate to French strategy he retained discretion over the operational and tactical matters of where, when and how. Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 5 Robin Pryor and Trevor Wilson In 2005, Pryor and Wilson wrote that the weather in September had been unusually good with only two rainstorms but that mid-autumn on the Somme was usually much wetter and that the British would be attacking into a valley which would require a five miles advance to get beyond. The 4th Army managed to capture Ocourt La Bea in early October but German artillery fire increased in volume, suggesting that a collapse was unlikely. When the weather broke, the next attack had to be postponed until 7 October, when six British and a French division attacked and mostly failed except at La Sars, because the lack of air reconnaissance led to an inaccurate bombardment, German reverse slope defences had disguised new defences and long-range machine gun fire was not suppressed by the creeping barrage. On 12 October, the 4th Army attacked with five divisions and had similar results, with some battalions managing to advance 400 to 500 yards but none gaining the first objective. Due to the weather hampering air reconnaissance and artillery observation and because German long-range machine gun fire came from guns dispersed evenly around the battlefield to evade British artillery bombardments. All of the divisions in the 4th Army were short of infantry after the September battles and those in early October depleted the infantry further, even in divisions considered fresh. The comparative failure of the attacks to gain ground was ascribed to lack of surprise, poor observation, the German recovery and long-range machine gun fire. Rawlinson wanted to delay attacks to assure good air support, different zero hours and the digging of jumping-off trenches to orientate the infantry in the featureless landscape and greater depth to creeping barrages, to hit the German machine guns far to the rear. These tactical requirements were contradicted by the operational and strategic necessity of continuing the battle through the winter and the attack on the 18th of October went ahead despite the requirements not being met, except for zero hour being set for 3.40 am, which led to the attack taking place in darkness, because low cloud obscured the moon. Haig reduced the scope of attacks but the effort on 23 October was another costly failure. The constant rain confined supply traffic to one road from Longval to Flares, which was frequently bombarded by German artillery, which made the difficulties of supply much worse. Another attack was ordered for 5 November and Pryor and Wilson described the representations made by Cavan, the 14th Corps commander, who wrote that he was willing to sacrifice men to support the 6th Army on the right but that a failure would be no help and could lead to the men losing confidence in their commanders. A local attack on the 3rd of November was another failure and Cavan insisted that Rawlinson witness the conditions at the front. Rawlinson agreed that attacks were futile, 
which Haig accepted until a meeting with Fock, where he was persuaded to continue to attack. Pryor and Wilson wrote that the attack on 5 November was another failure but smaller costly attacks continued for the rest of the month, despite not improving the tactical situation of the 4th Army. Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 6 J. P. Harris. In 2008, Harris wrote that in late September there had been legitimate grounds for thinking that the German defense of the Somme might collapse. German troops had lost morale, surrendered more willingly and suffered more casualties in September than in any other month. Air reconnaissance had revealed that the Germans were building three more defensive lines but are. I Stellung in front of La Transloy, was far less formidable than the three lines overrun since July. Harris also wrote of the rain and mud and that the Germans had relieved exhausted divisions during the respite, reinforced the artillery and moved machine guns to the rear, where they were less vulnerable but could fire through barrages at the British infantry. The 4th Army attacks on 7, 12 and 18 October had captured little ground at great cost, against far less formidable defences than earlier in the battle. By the middle of the month, Haig and Rawlinson agreed that the army could not remain in its positions on such low ground through the winter but that the attacks of 23, 28 and 29 October were costly failures, in an even worse morass than earlier in the month. Fresh troops became exhausted just moving up to the front line and in most of the 4th Army Division's battalion strengths had fallen from 800 men to about 350, living knee-deep in mud, eating cold food and soaking wet. Despite reports of the conditions and Kavan's objections, attacks in support of the 6th Army continued. The British lost another 2,000 casualties for no gain of ground and the French also had meagre results which led Fock to accept that little more could be achieved on the 4th and 6th Army fronts. Chapter 4 Section 1 Subsection 7 William Philpot. In a 2014 publication, Philpot wrote that the size and tempo of Anglo-French attacks of September could not be maintained in October and November, attacks became smaller and less ambitious. The British expeditionary force had become more proficient since July and the French continued to improve but the wet weather, high winds and shorter days made the delivery of supplies to the front line and the evacuation of wounded extraordinarily difficult. The attacks of the 6th Army, south of the 4th Army, were also postponed because of the weather, French aircraft were grounded and the flow of supplies interrupted. Attacks from 6 to 7 October achieved little and the offensive south of Bouchavanes towards Peron was abandoned. The French continued to attack to the northeast to capture the Saisels, next to the British attacks towards Bapaum. The 4th Army attacked a low ridge running northwest from La Transloy to Ligny but achieved little success amidst a jumble of trenches, derelict artillery positions and strong points. New German trenches dug between the flares and gird lines formed tiers of defences to fight from, which became a wasteland due to the ceaseless bombardments. The 4th Army slowly advanced into a dip overlooked from La Transloy and Wallencourt and towards the Butte de Wallencourt, from which German observers could see all round. Deliberate attacks on 7, 12, 18 and the 23rd of October and smaller local attacks were quickly forced to ground by German machine gun fire on the 14 and 15 Corps fronts but three Corps captured Lassars, before being held up around the defences of the Butte. The 6th Army experienced its worst fighting of the battle to capture the Saisels, attacking on a 2.5 miles in the same conditions as the 4th Army, with the same results for the same reasons. On the right of the attack, the French had more success and closed up on the southern approach to the villages but after the 7th of October this advance also slowed. In the middle of the month the villages were entered but not entirely captured until 12 November. The capture of the Saisels and La Sars were the only notable geographical successes in October and November. The German armies endured the same physical conditions but had a much narrower beaten zone between the front line and comparatively undamaged terrain. Mud reduced the effect of allied artillery, many shells not exploding or being smothered, and mud clogged small arms being carried over no man's land. British divisions fighting on the Somme for the second time had gained experience but German divisions had been kept in action for longer, 
new divisions were committed before they were ready and both sides had difficulty in replacing losses. The German army created 15 new divisions in the autumn from garrison troops, older conscript classes, ersatz reservists, the last depot reserves and the 1917 conscript class. The French filled gaps with shirkers, workers being disciplined and youths of the 1917 class. In the British Expeditionary Force, the first conscripts arrived and on 16 October, Private Harry Farr was shot by firing squad as an example, despite extenuating circumstances. Fayol judged that the battle should end and that the armies should wait for spring but in November, protests from senior officers like Cavan and the inspection report of Major John Gort were set aside. Haig, Fock and Joffrey insisted on continuing the offensive on the Somme, despite the appalling conditions, to support the battles at Verdun and on the Eastern Front, where the Russians were attacking in Galicia, and Romania was being overrun. On the Southern Front, the Italian army was on the offensive, and an attack had begun in Macedonia on the Balkan front. Philpott wrote that Allied firepower was still purgatory for the German infantry, Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment 16 fought on the Somme from 2 to 12 October and was eviscerated after suffering 1,177 casualties. The regiment had been dragged along in the darkness and night spewed out in ruins. The increased number of German divisions, aircraft, Artillery and ammunition sent to the Somme front in September and October reduced the effectiveness Anglo-French attacks in October but from 20 October to the 2nd of November, the French armies attacked at Verdun, exploiting the depletion of the 5th Army. The French advanced 1.2 miles recaptured Fort Douaumont on 24 October and Fort Vaux on 3 November. On the Somme, the French armies continued small attacks in November along with the British but from 14 to 16 November, the Germans counter-attacked at Bouchavains, retaking part of the Saisels and Royce Trench. Fock showed that a well-organized battle could be fought in a manner which was not unduly costly but that the Allies had not accumulated enough resources to defeat decisively the Germans. In September, Fock had managed to get the four Entente armies on the Somme to make coordinated attacks which brought the Germans close to collapse. In October, the autumn rains soaked the ground and slowed the tempo of attacks, which resembled the grignotage of late July and August. Such smaller, uncoordinated attacks could depress German morale but not deplete manpower at the rate achieved in September. The systems of organization and supply to maintain long offensives were not adequate to deliver the vast amounts of food, ammunition and equipment needed by million-man armies, even over the pre-war infrastructure of northern France. A reorganization was begun, using light railways to link railheads to the armies but this change did not mature until 1917 and became part of a cycle of initiative and response by the belligerents, which continued the battlefield equilibrium. Chapter 4 Section 2 Casualties the 21st Division suffered 4,152 casualties from 16 September to 1 October and New Zealand Division casualties from 15 September to 4 October, were 7,000 men. The 6th Division had 1,863 casualties from 9 to 20 October and during the month the 4th Division recorded just over 4,000 losses. The 8th Division had about 2,500 casualties from 23 to 29 October and the 29th Division lost 1,874 men from 11 to 30 October. The 30th Division had casualties of 2,650 men from 11 to 22 October. Chapter 4 Section 2 Subsection 2 Mud Rain during the summer had turned soil to mud but the heavier autumn rains created a much longer-lasting variety a mixture of soil and the chalky subsoil, which became liquid, yellow-gray mud which had extraordinary buoyancy and stuck to everything, covering men and jamming gun mechanisms and rifles. On roads, the mud stuck to wheels and caked the hooves of horses and mules. Men on foot were coated up to the knee and movement off the roads became impossible. Shell craters filled with a quicksand, which could drown soldiers and animals, a French writer called the Somme mud the worst on the Western Front. Engineers labored all summer to keep roads open and to lay new ones, 
build corduroy roads of logs and railway sleepers and laid duckboard tracks as the front moved eastwards. The slow Anglo-French advance increased the distance that supplies had to be carried, from the intact road system in the rear to the front line on the far side of the beaten zone, which brought the transport system close to collapse whenever it rained. More vehicles on the roads accelerated their decrepitude and Bin wrote that many of the lorries broke down and were pushed aside. Haig wrote on 21 November that The ground, sodden with rain and broken up everywhere by innumerable shell holes, can only be described as a morass, almost bottomless in places, between the lines and for many thousands of yards behind them it is almost, and in some localities, quite, impassable. The supply of food, and ammunition is carried out with the greatest, difficulty and immense labor, and the men are so much worn out by this and the maintenance and construction of trenches that frequent reliefs, carried out under exhausting conditions, are unavoidable. Stretcher bearers work for to a stretcher, reinforced by pioneers, men from divisional supply trains and anyone else who could be spared, including prisoners. From Good Court to the Longval Tramway, the carry was 3,500 yards in three stages. Illness increased in the British armies but routine measures to prevent trench foot, by rubbing feet with whale oil and donning dry socks, reduced the number of cases compared to 1915, despite the increase in the size of the biff. Combined frostbite and trench foot admissions to hospital in 1916 were 16,955 men against 22,718 the year previous. On the week ending 28 October, there were 707 admissions, 1,099 the next week and 1,417 during the next two weeks. By 30 December, 9,370 cases had been admitted in the British Expeditionary Force in the year, about 12.82 per 1,000 men as measured by ration strength. Chapter 5, Subsequent Operations Chapter 5 Section 1, The 23rd of October After the dismal result of the attack on the 18th of October, Fock, Haig, Rawlinson and Goff met and agreed to reduce the scope of attacks, weather permitting. The 4th and 6th armies were to attack on the 23rd of October towards La Transloy, ready to capture the village on the 26th of October, as the French advanced towards Roquigny in stages. The full programme for the armies on the Somme was washed out, despite urging by Joffrey for another general attack, Haig rejected the pressure from Joffrey, and denied that he was procrastinating. It was dry from 20 to 22 October, as 14 corps prepared to attack to the far side of the spur in front of Le Transloy, where after a 30-minute halt, the creeping barrage would move at 50 yards per minute, followed by the infantry, whose battalions had fallen lower than half strength during the recent fighting. Dawn was so foggy that Cavan agreed a postponement with the French from 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. The 4th Division attacked with two battalions of the 11th Brigade, next to the French 152nd Division. The 1st Hampshire and the French were quickly stopped by enfilade fire from Boritska slash Baniska trench opposite and from machine guns hidden in shell holes but when reinforced by the 1st Rifle Brigade, established posts northwest of the trench. To the left, the 2nd Royal Dublin Fusiliers joined with the left of the Hampshire, after capturing gun pits and a strong point further on. The 1st Royal Warwick were to leapfrog through the Fusiliers but became mixed up and attempts to advance were defeated in hand-to-hand -hand fighting and then flanking fire from both sides. The 12th Brigade on the left was defeated by machine gun fire from Dewdrop Trench near the Lesbouffs Le Transloy Road, parties of the 2nd Essex who got into the trench being overwhelmed. The 1st King's Own captured the German part of Spectrum Trench to the north of Dewdrop Trench and then advanced further, help arrived from bombers of the 2nd Dukes but only Spectrum Trench could be held. The 6th Division had been relieved by the 8th Division, and the 23rd Brigade attacked with the 2nd Scottish Rifles and 2nd Middlesex, capturing Zenith Trench. The rifles advanced another 200 yards and took Orion Trench but were bombarded out again late in the afternoon, as Middlesex attempts to bomb northwards failed. On the left the 25th Brigade attacked the north end of Zenith Trench with the 2nd Lincolnshire, which was stopped by small arms fire, except for a few men who linked with the 2nd Middlesex. 
The second rifle brigade further left was unable to capture a strong point where Zenith and Eclipse trenches met but managed to set up posts about 130 yards forward of the British front line. In the 24th Brigade area, the 2nd East Lancashire captured most of Mild Trench, took about 50 prisoners and defeated counterattacks from the flanks. Chapter 5 Section 2, the 24th October to the 3rd November Having relieved the 4th Division on the night of 23-24 October, the 1st Middlesex and 4th Kings Liverpool of the 33rd Division attacked at 6 a.m. and captured Rainy and Dewdrop Trenches but by 9.30 a.m. both had been bombed back out of Dewdrop Trench. Next day the 19th Brigade attacked on the right of the division with the 1st Cameron and the 5 6th Scottish Rifles, to take more of Boritska Trench but were repulsed by fire from machine guns in shell holes. During the day, the 17th Division relieved the 8th Division. On 30 October the 1st Anzac Corps relieved the 15th Corps between 14 and 3 Corps. On 1 November, the French attacked our I Stellung from the south, heading towards the Saizels but were forced back Beer 20, which took 208 prisoners. On the night of 31 October to 1 November, a regiment of the 39th Division prepared the jumping-off points for a counter-attack by IR-126 and IR-132 at 6.30 am but the two attacking regiments were late and arrived exhausted. Air support was cancelled because of the weather and the French were ready when the attack began, German artillery fired short and French small arms fire repulsed the attack. French attacks continued for the next week and a small part of Saint-Pierre Vastwood was captured on 5 November, through gaps in the positions of IR-126 and IR-172. On 9 November, the French and British attacked from Bouchavains to the Anchor and next day the 185th Division relieved the 39th Division, in which IR-126 had lost 1,229 casualties, including 205 killed. On the 4th Army Front, the 19th Brigade of the 33rd Division attacked again with the 1st Cameronians and the 5 6 Scottish Rifles, who got into Boritska Trench but were repulsed. At 3.30 p.m. the 1-9th Highland Light Infantry and the 2nd Worcester attacked Boritska Trench with the French but mud, exhaustion and machine gun fire from the Transloy forced them back out. Next day the 17th Division tried a surprise attack at 5.30 p.m. with a party of the 7th Borders and captured the rest of Zenith Trench. A counter-attack was defeated and a trench block set up 150 yards along Eclipse Trench. On 3 November the 7th Lincolns of the 51st Brigade repulsed a counter-attack on Zenith Trench and cleared a German foothold, assisted by the 7th Green Howards that evening. An attack by the 1st Queens of the 100th Brigade on Boritska Trench failed. Chapter 5 Section 2 Subsection 2 4-15 November On 4 November, a 98th Brigade attack on a ridge east of Dewdrop Trench failed and on 5 November the 33rd Division attacked at 11.10 am with the 2nd Worcester, who captured Boritska and Mirage Trenches and joined with the 16th KRRC that had captured Hazy Trench. In the 19th Brigade area to the left, the 2nd Royal West Kent advanced along the Les Bouffes Le Transloy Road but was unable to hold on, after patrols of the 7th East Yorkshire and 7th Green Howards of the 50th Brigade on the left were repulsed. The 1st Anzac Corps attacked on the left at 12.30 am, with the 1st Australian Division in a downpour, against a salient north of Goucourt. In the 1st Brigade, the 3rd Battalion bombed forward but the repulse of the 1st Battalion during two frontal attacks and a bombing attack on Hilt Trench, forced a withdrawal on the 3rd Battalion. The 7th Brigade attacked with the 27th Battalion on the right flank, a composite battalion of the 25th Battalion and a company each from the 26th and 27th Battalions in the centre and the 28th Battalion on the left, in which parties of the 27th Battalion entered Bayonet Trench and then retired at dusk. Troops of the composite battalion reached the maze and held on but the 28th battalion was repulsed, twice and retired. On the 8th of November, the 33rd division was relieved by the 8th division and after a lull with some dry days and on the 14th of November, the 2nd Australian division made a joint attack with the 28th, 
25th and 27th Battalions of the 7th Brigade. The 28th Battalion was relieved by the 19th Battalion brought up from reserve. The 50th Division on the right of 3 Corps cooperated with the 1/5th and 1th-7th Northumberland Fusiliers of the 149th Brigade, the combined attack beginning at 6.45 am in the 2nd Australian Division area to the right of Blue Cut that ran from Le Barque to Eau Court La Baie, the 25th and 26th Battalions to the right of the 19th Battalion were stopped by machine gun from the maze and artillery fire from the vicinity of Papaume. The 19th Battalion and the 1/5th Northumberland Fusiliers captured 350 yards of Gerd Trench but were unable to take Gerd support trench further on. The trench was found to have flooded, the British and Australian troops retired to Gerd Trench, where they were cut off. The 1/7th Northumberland to the left of the 1/5th Northumberland, may have captured Hook Sap but did not secure their part of Gerd Trench. They were fired on from Butte Trench and disappeared. Later in the day, two counterattacks were repulsed and half of the 20th Battalion attacked the maze at 4.45 pm but was stopped by machine gun fire. At midnight, troops from the 1 quarter and 1 th 5 th Northumberland attacked on the opposite flank but were forced back. On the 15th of November, the remnants of the 1 5th and 19th battalions that had met were isolated in part of Gerd Trench with a Lewis gun at either end. Rifle ammunition was used to feed the Lewis guns that engaged frequent German attacks. German Sturmtruppen, supported by artillery around Bapaume, made a determined attack from both ends of Gerd Trench and the British and Australians were relieved at dawn by the 28th Battalion and two companies of the 1 Quarter East Yorkshire. Opposite the French 6th Army, Operation Hanover, a plan to recapture the fringe of St. Pierre Vastwood on 15 November, succeeded but other attacks to recapture the Sizels failed and the Germans occupied shell hole positions on the outskirts. Chapter 6, Commemoration Chapter 6, Section 1, Newfoundland Memorial the participation of the Newfoundland Regiment in the Battle of La Transloy is commemorated with the Good Court Newfoundland Memorial. The memorial marks the place where the Newfoundlanders returned to the Somme in early October, after many losses incurred four months earlier, during an attack at Beaumont Hamel, on the first day of the Somme. The rebuilt Newfoundland Battalion, part of the 88th Brigade, attacked on the right flank of 15 Corps with the 1st Battalion Essex Regiment and captured part of Hill Trench, an extension of Rainbow Trench northeast of Good Court. The 1st Essex pressed on and parties reached Greece Trench but then had to retire to the start line when the 35th Brigade attack on the left failed. The Newfoundlanders held on in Hill Trench and also bombed up it to capture some of the Essex objective and established a trench block. The memorial also marks the furthest point that the British advanced from the front line of the 1st of July, during the Somme Offensive. The Rifle Brigade counted La Transloy as one of their battle honours for the Somme.